Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to PLC Blaster, a worm living solely in the PLC. We are currently in South Seas IJ um, with Mike Brugman. Uh, before we begin, a few brief notes. Um, be sure to stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB. Um, also, the Blackhead Arsenal is on in the Palm Foyer on level three, and the Arsenal reception is at 1700. Also, if you haven't picked up your merchandise today, it is your last chance, so visit the Black Hat Swag and Bookstore, and also visit the Cali Linux Lab and Mendeley Bay A. And thank you all for putting your phones on vibrate. Without further ado, Mike. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so, my name is Mike, and I'm going to present our research on industrial control systems now. Uh, before I start, I would like to give a short introduction about who we are. I work in a small company called Open Source Security and we are located in Germany. We are mainly focused on Linux security, but uh, the, uh, a few years ago we started to pen test embedded devices and related technology, for example RFID systems. In addition, we do uh, pen testing and research on industrial control systems. And uh, that is the reason why I'm here today. We developed a worm which is able to spread over PLCs. Our research was motivated by the Stuxnet worm. Stuxnet was a worm um, that attacks Siemens PLCs. Um, it uses Windows, bugs in Windows to spread, and that means uh, it requires Windows to spread. Um, starting from this assumption, we are wondering if it's possible to create a worm that is able to spread without any um, external hard or software support. And the answer is yes, it is possible. Before I show you how, you, uh, how we implemented the worm, I will give you some background information on the PLC we chose for our work. Uh, we chose a PLC called S7 uh, 1200. It's a Siemens PLC and it's built for a small application. We uh, chose this one because it's cheap. It costs about $150. It has 50 kilobytes of RAM and one megabyte of person persistent memory. Uh, it has built uh, in Ethernet and uh, we looked at it in firmware version 3 and we looked at the TIA portal in version 11. The TIA portal is a software that is used to uh, program the PLC. Compared to a uh, usual uh, um, computer, the system uh, works different. It works in cycles. Each uh, cycle will start with reading the inputs and writing the outputs. After that, the user program is executed. The user program is a piece of software that is uh, written by an engineer and controls the machine. For example, a traffic light or an assembly line or what machine ever. After that, uh, there are other uh, tasks taking place. For example, uh, communication with other PLCs. Each cycle has a time limit. Uh, in, in Siemens PLCs, it's usually uh, 150 milliseconds. If one cycle uh, takes longer than 150 milliseconds, the PLC will stop the execution and switch uh, to an error mode. Um, and the cycle is controlled by the firmware. Um, the, the program uh, that you can uh, write for the PLCs is structured in so-called program blocks. Um, there are six different types of program blocks. The first is called organization block. It's um, the entry point of the program and can be seen as a main function known from C. There are function uh, blocks. It's basically, uh, it's basically classes uh, known from object-oriented uh, programming languages. And um, there are functions. Functions are similar to uh, normal functions known from C. There are system function blocks and system functions. This is a library uh, which is uh, delivered by the vendor. And uh, in the end, we have um, um, data blocks. Data blocks are some kind of global memory. You can access it from everywhere in your program and can store any data in it. 
These program blocks are programmed in different, can be programmed in different programming languages. For example, letter diagram uh, here, or function, uh, function block diagram. And um, this, this are graphical based programming languages and they are used by uh, electricians who are familiar with this kind of diagrams. There are also uh, text-based programming languages, for example, structured text. Uh, we choose, uh, chose this one to implement the WARM. Um, yes, if you want to implement a PLC only WARM, you have to do it in the programming language of the PLC. Um, what parts uh, you have to, to implement? The first uh, part is the target discovery, because the WARM has to find its targets uh, by its own. After that, the worm wants to uh, copy itself uh, to the target system, so we need a carrier mechanism. After that, uh, the copy uh, needs to be activated, so the execution of the copy uh, needs to be started, and in the end, an attacker wants to have payloads to do some evil stuff on the PLC. We implemented all uh, four parts, and I'm going to show you how we did this step by step. I will start with uh, target discovery. The first thing you need uh, if you want to find PLCs on your network is a characteristic that allows, us, allows you to identify them. All Siemens PLCs have an open TCP port 102. So uh, if you find an open TCP port 102 in your network, the probability is high that you found a Siemens PLC. Our basic idea here was to implement a port scanner in the programming language of the PLC. We have two system function blocks uh, that helped us. The first is called TCON, it opens a new TCP connection, and TDISCON, it closes a TCP connection. On this slide, we can see uh, the call of the uh, TCON uh, function. Uh, there are a lot of parameters that are passed to the function. Uh, the most important are the IP address and the port you want to connect to. After the first call of this function, uh, the firmware will uh, process this function in background. And in the next cycle, we come back to this part of the code and call the function again. And um, now the function will tell us if the connection was established successfully. If yes, we found a new PLC and can continue with our infection. If not, we have a little problem because um, this function does not implement a timeout. So we have to do it by ourselves. Uh, we simply um, count the cycles in which we uh, failed to establish, uh, to establish a new connection. And if we hit an upper limit, we um, go, uh, call the t-discount function the function will fail because uh, you cannot close a connection that was never established, but it frees the resources for the next IP address we want to try. In the bottom corner, you can see how we select the IP address as the next IP address. We simply count up the last byte of uh, a four byte IP address, and that means we uh, scan and slash 24 subnet for an open TCP port 102. Okay. That is the target discovery. The next thing is the carrier mechanism. Um, normally, uh, user programs are transferred with the help of the TIA portal uh, via TCP to the PLC. And uh, our basic idea here was to implement this protocol in the PLC programming language. Again, we have two functions, tSend and tRecieve. Um, you can send and receive any TCP data uh, with uh, them. Uh, that helped us uh, with this task. The hard part here was to understand the protocol that is used to download or to, to transfer programs between um, the PLC and the TIA portal. Uh, it is called, the protocol is called S7COM+. It is a binary protocol and there is no um, uh, public documentation available on how the protocol is working. There are huge difference compared to the old uh, protocol used uh, uh, with uh, S7 300, 400 PLCs. It is slightly modified in the new firmware version or in the S7 1200 uh, devices, and it allows us to transfer programs to the PLC or back uh, into the TIA portal. 
You can do other things, for example, start or stop the CPU. You can change the outputs with the help of this protocol. Um, now I'm going to show you what we found out about this protocol. On this slide, you can see the first message that is sent from the TIA portal to the PLC um, if it wants to establish a new connection. Um, the protocol will start with the magic byte um, 72. After that, there's a version field. Um, there's a length field, which tells uh, us uh, how many data is transferred in this message. We have a type field, which tells us um, something about the intention of the message. For example, request, error, response. As a reserved field, we have a subtype, which tells us uh, something about uh, the intention of the message in more detail. And we have a sequence number. The sequence number is simply incremented uh, in every message. In the end, we have a frame and delimiter. And if this frame and delimiter is missing, it simply means that the message is continued in the next message. And between uh, the between the message head and the frame end delimiter, there are a lot, of, a lot of more bytes. And in the beginning of our analysis, we had problems to find any structure uh, in these bytes. But if you look closely enough, you will find a lot of A3 bytes. Um, this A3 bytes introduce a so-called attribute block. Attribute block structures the data that is actually transferred uh, with this protocol. Um, like the whole message, each attribute block has a basic layout. It starts with a three byte. There's an ID field which tells us uh, which value is transferred. In this um, example, it's some kind of server session. Um, there's a, a field which is usually zero. It's maybe some kind of format. Um, there's a data type field. In this case, it's a string. A string has a length field, and in the end, um, the actual value is placed. Um, at the beginning uh, of our analysis, we had problems to pass these uh, attributes correctly because all the uh, length value, uh, the length fields uh, contained wrong values. And uh, this is because um, numbers have a dynamic size in this protocol. Uh, you can see it in the first example, it, start with, it starts with a one bit, and that means there's a following byte. Uh, which also belongs to this number. In contrast to that, uh, the 16, it starts with a zero, and uh, that means um, there's no byte following. After that, we were able to, to pass the uh, blocks correctly. Um, on this slide, you can see the second message. The second message uh, is replayed uh, by the PLC. Um, is, uh, yes, it's an anti-reply uh, protection in this message. We are only interested in one byte, uh, it's a red uh, framed byte, and um, what you have to do is that you uh, need to flip the first bit of this byte and put the result in all your messages that you are going to send uh, to the PLC. So you can see the result in the uh, third message here, um, you need to place the result here, and um, this is a third message, and the third message completes the connection setup. There's another uh, interesting message um, that is a program transfer message. Um, the header uh, has two uh, more interesting fields. The first is the block type. It defines the program, uh, it defines the type of the program block we want to download, for example, uh, function block, uh, data block, so the ones I mentioned before. And uh, there's a block number. The block number is a place uh, where um, the, the program block is stored on the PLC. After that, there are a lot of attribute blocks uh, which transfer a lot of values. Um, for example, the modification time of the uh, program block, the source code of the uh, program uh, block is stored on the PSC, the bytecode that is actually executed by the PSC is stored um, on the PLC. And some of these values are only used by the PLC, for example, the bytecode, and others are only used by the TIA portal um, in case you want to receive your program back out of the um, PLC. 
Okay, uh, at this point we uh, knew uh, enough to create own messages and to um, uh, download or transfer own programs and we started to play with the protocol and we found some um, security flaws that are interesting if you want to implement a WARM. Uh, the first problem is a problem with data redundancy. As I mentioned uh, before, the block number is a place uh, where uh, the block is stored on the PLC and it's uh, transferred in the message head. But it's also transferred later in the message as attribute block. So the question is which of these values is evaluated by Siemens? And the answer is both of them. The first is only evaluated or used by the PLC and the second is only used by the TIA portal. Now consider the following situation. You create a new uh, program transfer message and choose a free number in the message head which is used by the PLC. But you choose a number that is already existing on the PLC um, in, the, uh, in the attribute block that is only used by the TIA portal. Now you uh, transfer this message to the PLC and the PLC will check the message head and will place the program block to a free slot and will start the execution. Um, if later an engineer wants to check the program, maybe he recognizes uh, strange behavior in his uh, industrial network, he will use the TIA portal and the TIA portal will download all program blocks that are on the PLC. Now the uh, PLC will get in trouble because it uh, sees that there are uh, two blocks with the same number, but uh, that is not possible. So uh, the TIA portal will solve this problem by only displaying one uh, of uh, the program blocks. And this allows us to hide parts of our code in front of the eyes uh, uh, of the engineer. Um, but uh, this is not working with data blocks. Uh, there's another problem with data redundancy. Um, the code is stored twice. It's stored as XML source, uh, source code. The source code is only displayed by the TIA portal and the bytecode. The bytecode is executed by the PLC. And if you want to create a Micheles uh, program, um, you just uh, write it and then you remove uh, the malicious uh, commands from the source code and download everything to the PLC. If, um, if an engineer will later check the program that is running on the PLC, he only will see the clean uh, source code and thinks that everything is okay, but the bytecode will exe execute um, the malicious commands. Uh, yes, um, and you can uh, leave out uh, blocks that are only used by the TI portal at all, and uh, this helps us to reduce the size of the bomb. Okay, at uh, this point uh, we knew a lot of, about the protocol, we knew how to set up a new connection, we knew how to overcome the anti-replay protection, and um, we implemented everything with the help of the TIA portal. The messages, messages that are used to transfer uh, the WARM program are stored in um, data blocks. The problem here is that you cannot create the data blocks with the help of the TIA portal because you only uh, know the exact content of the messages when you finish programming. What, we, uh, what you have to do is that you create the blocks manually. Um, you just download uh, the, the WARM with the help of the TIA portal. Uh, you capture all messages, uh, receive uh, the messages from the dumps, and create the messages um, by your own. And then in the end you can inject everything uh, with your own tool. Okay, that is the carrier. Um, the next thing is the activation function. This is uh, very simple because um, uh, you need to know uh, that, um, well, as I mentioned before, uh, organization blocks are the entry point of the program. But you need to know that uh, on PLCs you can have more than one uh, main function. Uh, you simply uh, add an additional organization block and the PLC will start the execution of uh, this block. So it's built in and we have to do nothing. In the end, 
uh, we want to create some payloads and because we are part of the normal uh, user program, we can do uh, whatever a normal user program can do. For example, we can stop the execution of the PLC, we can manipulate the outputs, we have the TCP functions to, uh, to implement a command and control server or a proxy or whatever we like. Uh, yes, so uh, we implemented all four parts and now um, I have a little demo. Um, what you uh, will see is that there's an attacker. The attacker will uh, infect the first PLC and after that uh, the worm will spread over the PLCs and in the end um, uh, the, worm, uh, the worms connect back uh, to uh, our command and control server which is running on the attacker's uh, computer. So okay, I created a movie. Here you can see our small example uh, factory. The factory is controlled by four Siemens uh, PLCs. You can see uh, them in the top corner. And uh, the different parts of the fabric are controlled by different PLCs. Uh, in this example, our machine produces uh, little yellow things. And um, yeah, everything is, is working normally. Um, what you uh, will see next is uh, that I connect, uh, disconnect three PLCs from the network because uh, I want to prevent the worm from sp uh, spreading too fast. Okay, I think this will happen now. Okay, now uh, the um, three PLCs are disconnected and on the right side you can see the attacker screen. The attacker will start a command and control server now. It's a little Python script written by us and the uh, command and control server waits for new connections. Now the attacker will infect the first PLC. Again, a little Python script written by uh, us and now you will see that the infection is in progress. It uh, takes some seconds and now the first PLC is infected. Now I will reconnect the three PLCs. Oh, you see uh, the um, first uh, worm already connected to our uh, command and control server. And now the worm will start to spread over uh, the other PLCs. You can see uh, that the factory is still working normally, but there is a short moment uh, during the infection, and I think it's right now, um, the yellow piece is not moving, um, where the uh, um, original user program is interrupted. So now uh, the second PLC connected, and after this uh, short period uh, of time, um, the PLC uh, works as uh, usually. Um, now, I think the other two are infected, so we have uh, the same problem with this little yellow piece again, and you can see all PLCs are connected now. After, after that, uh, the factory works normally again. So there's no uh, way to see that, that they are infected now. What I'm going to show you uh, now is that you can control the um, PLCs with the help of the command and control servers. Um, for example, we can uh, switch the outputs to values uh, we like. You will see that uh, the slider on the left side will move, um, but there is no yellow piece. Okay, now it's moving. So you, so you can control um, the PLCs with the help of the command and control servers. You can start the uh, assembly lines um, we can start the next assembly line. Okay, now both of them are moving. And we can stop everything again. We can uh, set the outputs to random values, for example. Now the fabric is out of control. And um, it is broken now. Um, in this example, it's it's... Uh, very easy to repair it. 
you will see that I have to repair it in a few seconds, so I stopped everything. Um, now the slider is not moving, but now it's fixed. And in this case, it's very easy. It's a, it's a small factory, but uh, if it's a real factory with big and expensive machines, um, your ma machines are broken now, maybe. So the next sli slider is also broken. I fix it too. Now the factory is working again. Um, what I'm going to show you uh, next is that we implemented a proxy server and um, what we can do is that um, the PLC uh, connects to us, uh, to the command and control server, and we can use this connection to connect back into the industrial network and can reach targets in this network with the help of the proxy server. So the proxy server is charted, and now uh, I will do an NMAP scan with, uh, uh, of one PLC with the help of another PLC. Okay, I think the scan will start in a few seconds. Yeah, okay. Now it, it starts to scan. So the, um, the proxy changed comma, uh, command in front of the nmap command uh, just uh, um, makes nmap to use the proxy server. You can see that the factory is still working normally. You um, will not recognize that something strange is happening. Uh, I think it will take some time, some time because Nmap will scan, um, I don't know, 1,000 ports. Um, we will see the result in a few seconds. Everything is still working. And now, where's the result? Oh, there. Okay, we have uh, two open ports, 80 and uh, 443. Um, there's a web server running on the, on the PLC. So now we are able to uh, connect to um, this web server, for example, and can transfer that data, but this is not part of the dem demo because I think you got the point uh, that we uh, can create uh, TCP connections um, to all devices that are in the industrial network. The last thing I want to show is the kill function. You can simply shut down the factory by typing in kill. And um, you will see that in a few seconds. I think right uh, now. Okay, you see the PLCs are, are blinking and um, the yellow please uh, stopped to move and all PLCs disconnected. Uh, that is because the PLC switched into an error mode and an engineer has to reset the devices device by device to making the factory work again. Okay, that was the demo. Now back to the slides. Okay, um, we saw that the original user program was um, interrupted for 10 seconds and this uh, also generates a log entry in the PLC. But uh, there's an improvement. You can, um, so, so we need to stop uh, the, the original user program because we add a new uh, organization block. And uh, this is only possible if the execution is uh, stopped. But uh, the improvement is uh, that you can patch um, existing OBs um, uh, online. You just uh, can add new code to them. Um, this was already shown at Black Hat uh, 2015 in the talk. Uh, the talk was called Internet Facing PLCs. Um, this will work here too, but uh, the worm will get more complex. Um, the worm uh, uses memory, uh, nearly 40 kilobyte of RAM, and um, 220 kilobyte of persistent memory. Uh, you can reduce this by, for example, by creating a more specific payload, but uh, it's already small enough to fit in all the different uh, S7-1200 models. The cycle time is important. The cycle time is the time uh, um, which, uh, which you, in which you can execute a user program without interruption, and it's usually 100 
and 50 milliseconds. And our warm, uh, uh, the longest cycle we could measure during the infection process um, was seven milliseconds. And that <clears throat> matches our assumptions because we uh, use communication uh, functions as uh, most of the time. And these functions are processed in the background by the firmware. Um, yes, uh, the worm is part of the normal user program, so uh, the worm will survive a cold restart. If you want to remove the worm, you <clears throat> can do a factory reset, which deletes the complete um, user program, or you can overwrite the um, program block that is used by the worm. Um, the TI portal uh, is able to recognize the worm. You can see that on this slide. In the upper corner, we have green program blocks. These uh, blocks are the blocks that an engineer wants to have on the PLC. But in the bottom corner, you see uh, um, <clears throat> program blocks that are not green, that are new um, program blocks. And an engineer maybe starts to uh, re uh, reserve engineer these blocks now. But what you can do is um, you can create um, strange attribute blocks and place them on the PLC. And if the uh, TIA portal uh, download uh, all uh, program blocks, uh, it will crash because of these strange attribute blocks. And an engineer is not able to, um, to, ch uh, to check the PLC, to check the program that is running on the PLC. This means um, that the TIA portal is not a good tool to analyze malware on uh, PLCs on Siemens PLCs. Um, protection, uh, the S7 provides uh, three different protection uh, mechanisms. Uh, the first is called know-how protection. And the know-how protection protects unauthorized reading or modification of the code. If you enable this protection, there uh, is an attribute block. You can see it here in the bottom corner that is uh, added to the program transfer message. And there's basically uh, an enable flag, uh, which tells us if the pro protection is enabled or not. And uh, there is a SHA-1 hash of the password. You have to provide a password when you enable this protection. Uh, in addition, the source code is AES encrypted. Now, uh, if you want to disable um, this um, protection, what you have to do, you simply download uh, this block with your own tool then you change uh, the flag to zero and uh, upload everything again and the protection is disabled. Um, the problem here is that the source code is still AES encrypted. And the question is how is the AES key generated? As I mentioned earlier, this, um, this attribute block, you can, uh, you can download it simply by asking the PLC, please uh, give me the program block and you will get this uh, SHA-1 hash <clears throat> because it's part of the program uh, block. And now how is the AES key uh, generated? It is calculated from uh, this hash. You simply truncate the hash to uh, 128 bit and XOR it with M. Um, the problem is that M is displayed on this slide, and so you are able to uh, um, calculate uh, the key by your own. Um, so that means uh, that this protection is ineffect ineffective because it's broken, and um, it only protects existing code. Uh, but our WARM adds only new code. Um, this is fixed by Siemens in the newest TIA portal version. Uh, there's another protection called copy protection, and uh, this uh, allows you to bind your program to a specific PLC. Um, you, can, you need to enter a serial number of the PLC, and uh, the TIA portal will only transfer your program to that specific PLC. Um, the problem here is that you can simply change the serial number if you have your own uh, donut upload tool, or you um, just can download um, whatever serial number to whatever PLC because this number is only checked by the TIA portal and not by the PLC. So that means it's a client-side protection, so it's not uh, effective. There's a last protection uh, which is called access protection, and this protection um, 
does not protect the program, but it limits the features that are can used without um, the uh, without uh, providing a password. Um, so, so the features of the of the um, protocol we use to transfer uh, the <coughs> the program the worm. And there are basically two different uh, protection levels. The first is called write protection. The second is called read and write protection. And if you enable this protection, uh, you have to provide a password before you can download uh, programs to the PLC. And this is an effective protection uh, until the worm knows the password. Um, it works, but it is uh, disabled by default. So it's a very good idea to activate uh, this protection on your PLCs. Um, then uh, uh, we looked at other vendors because uh, we were wondering if it's a Siemens-specific problem or if maybe other vendors are um, yeah, infectable too. Um, there are three main features we use to implement the worm. The first is uh, industrial Ethernet. Then uh, we need um, a way to transfer our uh, program via TCP to the PLC. And in the end, we need uh, programmable TCP functions. And uh, on this slide, you can see a list of leading vendors, for example, Siemens, uh, Mitsubishi, Schneider, Rockwell Automation. And we checked. Um, um, the, the PLCs simply for this uh, three features. And um, there's only one PLC that is not able to, um, um, yeah, you cannot program uh, it uh, via TCP. And uh, there are some more PLCs that are not able or that not have programmable um, TCP functions. But you can see there are still a lot of um, vendors left. <coughs> So uh, this PLCs might be infectable by worms too. So it's not a Siemens specific problem. The problem is that you can change user programs uh, without um, without the need uh, to to provide a password in the default configuration. So we we used no uh, bug or, or exploit to implement uh, the worm. Everything works as expected. So it's just implemented everything, uh, implementing everything in the PLC programming language. Um, yes, and that's the end of my talk, and I thank you for your attention.